In this video, I'm going to talk about kinematics and kinetics, our two aspects of dynamics. So kinematics is the analysis of movement in terms of mechanical elements like space and time. Um, so all of the joint actions that we've been talking about so far, that's all been kinematics. Um, so analysis of movement in terms of space and time. So analysis of movement of the shoulder, like if we look at the glenohumeral joint, we're talking about, you know, the humerus or the limb is moving through space in this direction. It's taking this long to complete. Um, so just saying here is how we're moving in space and here is the time sequence that that's happening in or how long it's taking. Um, that's all kinematics, the analysis of what that body or what that movement looks like as the body is moving through space and time. Um, it's without consideration of the forces that cause the movement. Okay, so in kinematics, we don't care about how much muscle force we produce to move the limb um, or how much gravity was working against us or anything like that. We're not looking at the forces. We are simply analyzing uh, the actual movement in space and maybe a time sequence like, um, you know, did the elbow flex before or after the shoulder abducted and that sort of thing. So time sequence and how we're actually moving. The kinetics is where we look at the forces. Uh, so that's analysis of the forces involved in a movement. Uh, so when we get into the kinetics of an action, we're analyzing how much force each muscle produced and in what order did they produce those forces. Um, we're looking at gravity, friction, any other forces that are acting on the system. Okay, so kinematics, the analysis of the movement in space and time. Kinetics, the analysis of the forces that caused or are caused by the movement. Okay, motion uh, is any change in position that can be described in space and time. Um, so it's not motion unless time has passed while we change from one position to another, um, which in life, that's the only way we change position <clears throat> is through motion. But like, let's say I show you one picture and then I show you another picture. If no time passed, that wasn't motion. That was just two snapshots of different positions, if that makes any sense. Um, so for motion to take place, there has to change. There has to be a change in space that took place over passing of time. Okay, force is an influence <clears throat> that can change the shape or motion of a system. A force doesn't have to change the shape or motion of a system, but it can. And we'll talk in great depth about forces. Closed and open skills. An open skill is a skill that's completed under change in conditions in which the parameters of the activity are constantly varying. That's almost all athletic skill. Uh, so that's like playing soccer, basketball, all pretty much any athletic skill or sport um, mostly is involving open skill uh, where there's competitors or the ball is moving or you're on different terrain. Um, you know, there are all kinds of parameters and conditions that are just constantly changing. And so that's an open skill is when we're participating or completing a skill um, under different circumstances all the time. So we have to constantly adapt to the new conditions. A closed skill is completed under standard conditions in which the parameters of the activity are unchanging. Um, and now that's relative, relatively unchanging. So that could be like shooting a free throw or kicking a field goal. Um, so relatively unchanging where um, the, the parameters might change a little bit. Like when you're kicking a field goal, maybe it's a windy day. Like that's a change in parameter. Um, but more or less, the, the skill itself is relatively the same. Uh, like a field or um, a free throw is a really great example of that because you're the same distance from the hoop. Everyone is positioned in the same kind of way. Uh, but again, parameters might change. Maybe somebody sneezes right as you're about to throw the ball. Um, or you might have your the fans of your opponents in front of you behind the hoop, you know, trying to distract you. Um, so relatively standard conditions, but, you know, relative. 
Okay, motion. Uh, so first talking about relative motion is motion of one object relative to another object. Um, so I included a picture here of the inside of an airplane. So that's a good example of relative motion. Um, you know, the, the plane is hurtling through space at an incredibly fast speed. Um, and yet you might be walking in the plane in the opposite direction. You know, maybe you're walking backwards down the aisle of the plane, but the plane is going through space at 500 miles an hour, <laughs> however fast the plane's flying. Um, and so your movement towards the back of the plane is relative motion to the plane itself. In reality, you are hurtling through space, you know, at hundreds of miles per hour, and you're only moving towards the back of the plane, you know, relative to the plane itself. That's relative motion. Okay, translation is another word for linear motion. So we'll use both terms in this class. So it's important you know that they mean the same thing. Uh, it's movement of the entire system simultaneously along one of the X, Y, or Z axes. So like a plane flying through the air, that's a good example. If it's going in a straight line, that's a good example of linear motion is that whole plane flying through the air all simultaneously. Uh, when the entire system moves the same direction by the same distance at the same time. Okay, so like a plane flying through the sky, a car driving on the road, um, those are all examples of linear motion if it's driving or traveling in a straight line. Um, in the human body, there is almost no linear motion. That's rare. Or I, I guess on a very small level, there's linear motion. Like um, if we've got the femur sitting on top of the tibia, there might be some linear motion in the anterior posterior direction, just as an example. But in terms of our normal body movement, it's almost all angular motion. It's almost all rotation. <coughs> um, so it's, you know, for the whole body to move forward all at once, we'd have to be like on a moving sidewalk or something. Um, because how we walk forward, how we walk or run, is by a series of, you know, bones rotating around each other. This is angular motion. Flexion extension in the sagittal plane is how we move forward. Um, and that's all rotation, angular motion happening around a joints, you know, sequentially in the right order um, and alternating to cause us to move forward. So uh, when we walk or run or anything like that, it's not linear motion, even if we're running in a straight line, it's just a lot of angular motion happening on smaller levels to cause the body to move forward. Uh, so the whole body's not moving forward all at once when we're moving. Um, so again, there are small examples like uh, the scapulas might have some linear motion, you know, where they move in a straight line up and down or in, in certain ways, but um, it, there's a very minimal amount of actual true linear motion in human movement. Um, so like I mentioned, most of it is rotation or angular motion. Um, it's when a system is constrained and may only move around a fixed axis in a circular path. Okay, so like, let's go back to the elbow here. My forearm and then my hand is constrained by where it's attached to my humerus. So this would be the axis. So it's, there's a fixed axis that my limb has to rotate around. Now where that axis is in space, I can move, I can manipulate that by moving my glenohumeral joint or my trunk or my whole body. So I can manipulate where that is, but in any case, my form is still gonna be constrained and attached and only able to move around that one axis. And so because it can only move around that one axis, it's only able to rotate around that hinge um, and, and cause angular motion. So most of our body works that way, but of course there are exceptions. So we'll talk a lot about linear motion and angular motion in future lectures. Okay, a kinetic chain is a system of segments that are subject to forces. Uh, so kinetic chain is relative to whatever it is that we're studying or analyzing. Uh, the kinetic chain could be the entire body, it could be just the upper extremity, the lower extremity, the spine, any combination of those things. Um, so a kinetic chain is just whatever chain of segments it is that we are analyzing. 
a simple kinetic chain is when um, every chain in the segment only has one or two linkages. Okay, so like if we look at our little diagram here, you can see the upper extremities if we stop at the shoulder. Um, so just if we go through hand, elbow, shoulder, that would be a simple kinetic chain because each one only articulates with one or two other segments. So there's only one or two linkages. Um, compared to like now if we add in neck or if we look at the lower extremity and get all the way to the pelvis, the pelvis has three linkages. So the right pelvis, the left pelvis, and up to the spine. That's three linkages. So that would mean it's a complex kinetic chain. So the entire body would be a complex kinetic chain because we have some linkages or some segments that participate in three or more linkages. Uh, but if we're only looking at portions of the body, it could be simple or complex depending on if any of the segments have three or more linkages. Okay, so a closed kinetic chain is when the most distal segment is stationary. Now, this is relative to what the action is that we're analyzing. So the most distal segment, we might be talking about the lower extremity, or we might be talking about the upper extremity. Okay, so the most distal segment is stationary and anchored or connected to something. Or an open kinetic chain, the most distal segment is freely movable or not anchored or connected to something. Okay, so the reason I'm emphasizing that it's relative to the action we're performing is because like, let's take, um, like you see the picture on the top there, he's doing a front barbell squat, you know, so he's got his weight kind of balanced up on his chest here, and he's gonna go down into a squat. So that's a leg exercise, obviously. And so whether it's a closed or open chain is relative to what the legs are doing. Okay, so the most distal segment, that would be the feet in this case, is they're stationary and they're anchored on the ground. So that means that that exercise is a closed kinetic chain exercise. Now, just because the feet are on the ground for an exercise doesn't make it closed kinetic chain. Because now let's take an example where let's say we're gonna do a shoulder press, an overhead press, and we're standing on our feet. Now, it's relative to what the exercise is or what the, what the movement is, uh, because now if we're doing an overhead press, now we're analyzing the movement of the upper extremities. And in that case, the most distal segment is the hands, and they're freely movable. They're not anchored to anything. They're moving through space. You might be holding dumbbells or barbell or something, but they're still moving through space. They're not anchored. Um, and so even though the feet are on the ground, that's not the segment that we're analyzing. So that would be an open kinetic chain exercise. Okay, an example of an open kinetic chain for legs would be like the bottom picture there where he's doing a leg extension. Um, and so in that case, legs are where we have the movement and that's what we're analyzing. And so the most distal segment would be the feet and they're moving up and down. They're not anchored or, or staying stationary. Okay, so moving up and down. An example of a closed kinetic chain exercise for upper extremities would be like a pull-up. Okay, so pull-up, you're coming from the bar, the bar is stationary, so your hands are stationary holding the bar and you're pulling up and your body is what is moving up and down. Um, so there are fewer closed kinetic chain upper extremity movements then lower extremity, lower extremity, they're easy to come by, but upper extremity, there are fewer examples uh, because most upper extremity actions, our hands are freely movable um, rather than our hands being fixed and our body moving around our upper extremities. Okay, a functional kinetic chain is a type of complex kinetic chain where we have alternating or simultaneous open and closed kinetic chains happening. Um, produces a functional activity, so we have lots of functional kinetic chains. Uh, it's, it's not super common in life that we have purely open or purely closed kinetic chains because we're always moving and alternating and um, usually experiencing a blend of both. Uh, so that includes like running and all kinds of athletic skills. So when we're running, 
when one foot is in contact with the ground, that chain, that limb that's in contact with the ground, that's a closed kinetic chain, while the other leg that is up in the air, that is an open kinetic chain. And the arms the whole time are open kinetic chains. But the legs are alternating open, closed, open, closed, open, closed while you're running. Um, and so many of our athletic skills and many of our normal functional movements are some blend or alternation of open and closed kinetic chains. Compensatory movements happen uh, when we start to move abnormally. So like if we have a joint that's not moving correctly, other links in the chain will pick up the slack. So they'll, the other links will start to move abnormally so that we can still accomplish the task. So it's like, let's say I'm reaching for something up high on a shelf. Now maybe I would normally reach for it by flexing my glenohumeral joint and extending my elbow to reach for that thing on the shelf. But now let's say shoulder flexion hurts. Maybe you have some kind of tendinopathy or some kind of injury and that shoulder flexion hurts. So now instead, I might do some shoulder abduction to reach for it and kind of do a side movement to grab for it. I'm not at all saying one of those ways of reaching is better or worse. I'm just giving an example that maybe this is the normal way that I do that pattern or that I complete that action. And that if I no longer can do that, that's not available to me because I've got some kind of pain or problem, I'm gonna come up with some compensatory way to achieve the same task of reaching for whatever it was on that shelf. Um, so the way we plan motor actions is based on the goal. You know, we're not thinking, okay, now I'm going to flex bicep or I'm going to flex whatever to, or I'm going to contract bicep. We're not thinking about what muscles we're using or what exact way we're moving the limbs, we're thinking about the end goal of reaching for the thing on the shelf. And so if we can't do it the way our brain wants to plan that action, we'll just do it a different way. Um, and in some cases, that different way is completely healthy and fine and causes no problem. And in some cases, the different way um, causes more of an issue. Sometimes that different way is uh, a male adaptation, meaning like it's harmful. Uh, could cause more injury or overuse disorders or or something else or just cause bad habits or bad form like in athletic skills and things like that. Uh, so in some cases it's a problem and in some cases it's not. So we'll get into that a lot more when we talk about posture analysis. Okay, that's all I have for you for this lecture. I'm going to stop recording here. Okay, see you for the next one.